So um, I'll say a little bit more about the uh, the, pre the film itself uh, right before we show it. But I'm really excited to be showing it here at the Siegel Center. Uh, Siegel Center has been one of the places that I felt like really got the ball rolling with this sort of Reza Abdo renaissance for him. And about 15 years ago, I really felt like Reza just wasn't getting his due and was um, things began to start on a group level. And uh, uh, Frank was always uh, putting together um, you know, group uh, weekends about Reza. He uh, screened the Adam Soch's terrific documentary about Reza. So it feels really fitting that we're here. And uh, um, another really important, you know, a crucial uh, instigator of the Renaissance, <laughs> if, if we can call it, was the Dune Magazine, which uh, co-curated the amazing show at MoMA PS1, which really put Reza back in the conversation in a very large way. So I'm really uh, you know, happy that Elizabeth White from the Dune Magazine is going to start things off with a little presentation, giving a little uh, background and Reza's life and work. So uh, Elizabeth, why don't you come on up? Hi, everyone. Um, thank you, Tony, um, for inviting me here to speak a little bit about Reza. Um, my name is Elizabeth Wyatt. Um, I am a contributing editor at The Dune. Um, and I'm here to give you just a little bit of a brief overview about Reza's life and work so that you have some context as you go into um, viewing a father with a peculiar man. Um, as Tony mentioned, um, at the Dune, we did a um, show on Reza's work at MoMA PS1 in 2018. And that was followed by a um, truly outsized, appropriately maximalist book about Reza that we published in 2021. And um, much of my presentation today is drawn from the research that we did for the book. And much of that research wasn't just archival work, it wasn't just with secondary materials, but a lot of it involved um, very ex expansive, extensive oral histories um, with Reza's company members. Um, and so, um, as much as I'm the only one here speaking right now, I think there's going to be a sense of polyvocality here too, at least I hope there will be. Um, Reza Abdo um, created viscerally intense, densely referential, monumental pieces of avant-garde theater that defy the conventions of the form. He pushed his actors to the limits, bringing together source material, both ancient and contemporary, high and low, to critique the political realities of his time, including governmental indifference to AIDS, genocide in Europe, and war in the Middle East. To some, he represented the second coming of Peter Sellers or Antonin Artaud. To naysayers, he represented the worst of liberal culture run amok, all filth and sex and violence irredeemably immoral. He was a queer, HIV-positive Iranian immigrant in Reagan's America. His outsider status was threefold, but that very outsider status allowed him to challenge our culture's most deeply seated values and beliefs. Reza was born in February 1963 in Tehran to Ali Abdo and Homa Mohajani. Ali, uh, excuse me. Ali, by that point, was about 35 years old. He was Iranian, but he had gone to college in the United States and lived there for nearly a decade. He was a very successful entrepreneur who was close to the last Shah, Mohammad Reza Pahlavi. He was also profoundly athletic. As you can see here, um, there was an old magazine issue of Life that profiled his successful one-man defeat of an entire American volleyball team. He took these athletic interests back to Iran, where he founded the Persepolis Football Club, as well as an entertainment center named Bowling Abdo. Ali, through his business endeavors, amassed quite a bit of wealth as well as influence. But it was Reza's mother, Homa, who really represented Iran's old money, its old guard. 
It was to his mother and her family that Reza attributed his artistic sensibility. His mother, he said, could have been a great poet. Her cousins, her nieces and nephews became scholars and artists. And so you have this sort of dichotomy, this, this binary emerge in Reza's self-mythologization. His dad was the brutish athlete whose sole purpose was to acquire wealth and power. His mother was the sensitive, civilizing force who valued art. That, at least, is how they are presented um, in Reza's work. Um, I should also mention that Homa was many years younger than um, Ali was when they married, um, which caused some conflict, um, which was exacerbated in 1979 um, when Ali basically lost all of his money after the Shah's regime fell to revolutionary forces. Around that time, Homa asked him for a divorce. He granted her one on one term, that she stay in Iran while he fled to Los Angeles with their three sons, Reza, Salah, and Sid. Reza, at the time, um, was enrolled in the Wellington boarding school in England. He had received an elite Western education, which ended up heavily influencing his theater work. The stark reversal of fortune that his family experienced during the revolution is one that I imagine he personally likened to a Greek tragedy. Soon after the family's arrival in California, um, Ali suffered a heart attack. Um, the apocryphal story is that Reza coming out to him as gay literally killed him. Reza was only 17, and suddenly he found himself having to care for two younger brothers. He worked menial jobs at gas stations or at the front desks of hotels. If you believe the stories of Tom Fitzpatrick or Brendan Doyle, and we have no reason not to, Reza even hustled to survive. Though he enrolled at the University of, Sal Su excuse me, University of Southern California, he dropped out soon after. But at the same time that all of this uncertainty and upheaval was happening, Reza somehow discovered his life's calling. He wanted to make theater. Lacking academic training in theater in any meaningful way, and barely out of his teens, but preternaturally talented, Reza quickly developed a reputation as the LA theater scene's wonderkind. Perhaps owing to his boarding school education, he began by staging classic and recent plays from the European dramatic canon. He directed a trio of Howard Brenton plays at the Hole in the Wall Fifth Estate Theater in 1983. He did a sort of Nushkin inspired production of King Lear at the Gangway Performance Center in 1985. He did a production of Franz Xaver Kroetz's The Farm Yard at the theater upstairs on Hollywood Boulevard. Also, oops, I just realized I went too far. You just got a little bit of a preview of what I'm gonna talk about next. Um, um, no, actually, hold on. Did I have, oh, yes, they're in the wrong order. Excuse me. <laughs> um, he directed a trio of Howard Brenton plays at the Hole in the Wall Fifth Estate Theater in 1983. He did a Nushkin-inspired production of King Lear at the Gangway Performance Center in 1985. And he did a production of Franz Xaver Kroetz's The Farmyard at Theater Upstairs on Hollywood Boulevard, also in 1985. But it was really with 1986's Amadea, Requiem for a Boy with a White White Toy, that I think we see Reza's mature aesthetic start to germinate. As implied by its title, Amadea drew from Euripides' famous play about a scorned wife's choice to murder her children in an act of retaliation against her husband for cheating on her. But it wasn't a straightforward adaptation. Rather, it wove together excerpts from Euripides' script with selections from Shakespeare's Macbeth, Tennessee Williams's Cat on a Hot Tin Roof, Dear Abbey Letters, Children's Story, Are You My Mother, Gertrude Stein verses, and original writing from Abdo and a woman named Mira Lani Oglesby. Taken together, the source material alchemized into a play not about a mother's murder of her children, but about a child's grief about losing their mother. Uh, it is easy to read um, Reza's separation from Homa into this work. Even so, mother figures largely exist on the periphery of Reza's canon. 
It is instead the father, the patriarch, who looms large over and in most of Reza's major works. This patriarch, as some of you might know, is almost always played by Tom Fitzpatrick. Here's the slide you already saw. Um, he's a farmer in the farmyard. He's Crayon and Big Daddy in Amadea. He's Crayon in King Oedipus, Juan Perón and Eva Perón, Dr. Gene Scott in Peep Show, the father in Boogeyman, Warren Maxwell in Tight Right White, and the dual symbol of American patriarchy, the Puritan and the businessman in Reza's final work, Quotations from a Ruined City. And father was a peculiar man. Tom Fitz is Fyodor Pavlovich Kalamatsov, who, like Ali Abdo, was the father to three sons, Dmitri, Alyosha, and Ivan. I think we would all caution against a too simple biographical reading of Reza's work. But Ali, who bullied Reza for not living up to his expectations of what an oldest son should be, Ali, physically violent, who thought Reza was too queer, too bookish, too effete, too unathletic, had clearly lodged himself into Reza's psyche. Yet what Reza does so brilliantly in Father, as well as in plays like Boogeyman, is link his personal experiences, his personal traumas, to larger social, cultural, and even mythic issues. Doubles, triples, even quadruples abound in Reza's work. The patriarch and father is not just Fyodor Kalamatsov. It is also the benevolent John F. Kennedy and the not so benevolent Donald J. Trump. Reza uses his experiences at the hands of his particular father as ammunition in a larger battle against the perniciousness of patriarchy as such. Given the deeply personal nature of the work, uh, there's no doubt that Reza himself was responsible for generating much of the material for his plays. But it should be noted that he wasn't a playwright in the traditional sense. He was ultimately a director, an artist whose great skill lie in bringing together disparate images, gestures, sounds, and written material, literary, news stories, court transcripts, popular songs, one-off words uttered by his company members in startling and unusual combinations. Reza was a collage artist. He was the ideas guy. He had the vision. And while he did write a good amount of the text of his plays, it's important to stress that he also relied on collaborators, such as dramaturgs or other playwrights. I mentioned Miralani Oglesby in passing. She was his primary collaborator in his early years in Los Angeles. She worked with him on the text for Amadea, Minamata, Peep Show, Father Was a Peculiar Man, and likely other works from that period as well. The chemistry between Reza and Miralani was electric. They fought like a married couple, even though Reza was gay. Here, I wanna flag something really important. Reza's company members, the members of Dara Luz, are some of the most astute critics we have on Reza's work. And so in describing Reza's working relationship with Miralani, I actually wanna to defer to some words from Tony. Um, when we were doing the book, he told us, quote, the thing with Miralani was that she could really claim to be on equal standing with Reza as co-creator of the shows. He was a writer. The plays are full of these insanely fantastic lines that are pure Reza. But he was more this methodical sifter of gold, where Miralani was a volcano of text. I think Reza was perfectly happy working with her, as long as she remained a font of usable text that he could do whatever he wanted with. When he started feeling pushback from her, that created a conflict, end quote. Father, for reasons that I will delve into further as I close out this talk, was a transitional piece for Reza. It marked the shift from his early work in LA storefront theaters to his mature work at the Los Angeles Theater Center and his work in New York. One of the reasons it's transitional is because it was his last full collaboration with Miralani. In his final years, he'd shift to writing with his brother, Salar. 
I'd like to now pivot a bit and talk about residents' use of space, especially because it's so important for a site-specific piece like Father. Um, as a director, he's really known for two things. Uh, his main stage productions in the LAPC's Proscenium Theater, and then his site-specific productions that makes, made use of unusual spaces in unusual ways. A Medea, uh, which I mentioned previously, uh, was staged in a rec center in a gym in Los Angeles. Um, Pasos in La Obscuridad, uh, which Reza would do for the Los Angeles Festival um, not too long after Father, uh, was staged in the terrace room of the Park Plaza Hotel. Um, but it is Peep Show, um, which was staged at the Courtesy Inn on North Highland Avenue in Los Angeles in April 1988 that I think provides the most interesting point of comparison for Father. This was a true piece of site-specific theater. As mentioned, it took place in a hotel, specifically six hotel rooms, where six different scenarios about power and subjugation played out. Audience members moved from room to room, an egg timer marking the pace. Each scene lasted 25 minutes. We have little extant documentation from this piece, but I imagine that the experience must have felt a bit cramped for viewers. As its title implies, it was also intended to feel voyeuristic. Viewers squeezed onto beds together to watch scenes that felt private, intimate, like something that should be kept out of view. They shared the same space with the actors, but something about the drama felt uncomfortably alienating like watching the marriage of Artel and Brat. Father both extends and revises this use of space. Like Peep Show, it asked its audience to share space with the actors, but the space itself was much different. Traded for the cramped motel rooms of Peep Show were the sprawling cobblestone streets of the meatpacking district in New York pre-gentrification. Passersby and residents were unwitting witness to the action. It drew on the tradition of the medieval pageant, the roving mystery play cycles that both delighted and instructed common citizens by presenting stories from the Christian Bible. The cobblestone streets evoked the 19th century spirit of the Father's Karamatsa, the Dostoevsky novel on which the play was roughly based. According to the critic Marvin Carlson, quote, Almost all of the plays shared the same general shape, a more or less guided procession to a new location defined by a number of theatrical set pieces, this location serving as a central gathering spot for a variety of images, events, and speeches, end quote. The meatpacking district was, at the time, a bit of a no man's land, a neighborhood that, uh, due to the industry it supported, often smelled like blood and shit. It was also one of the most popular sites for gay cruising and public sex in New York prior to the AIDS crisis. In his review of the play, David Kaufman described the culminating scene of Father, called Yvonne's Nightmare, by comparing it to the sex club, The Mineshaft, which had been located close by. Yvonne's Nightmare evoked the voyeurism of Peep Show, but it placed it in a specifically sexual and queer context. Kaufman describes it thusly, quote, a couple could be seen fucking in an elevator shaft at the top of the stairs where you entered the space. In the main room, a number of naked men were washing themselves, being washed, or involved in a variety of s and activities. One was hanging upside down and being whipped by another. Still another was sprawled naked and tied to a bed where clothes pins were applied over different portions of his body, end quote. For those who know Reza's work, it's easy to see and hear shades of the cramped scenes of s and that we will go on to see in Boogeyman and The Law of Remains. We're not entirely sure when exactly Reza found out he was HIV positive. We do know that he made this fact publicly known a few months after Father was produced while doing press for his play, The Hip Hop Waltz of Eurydice. Critics and Darlu's company members alike have argued that the HIV diagnosis caused the dramatic shift that we see between the early works 
and the pieces he did with Dara Luz. A Medea, Father, and Pastos were all sprawling durational works, clocking in at about three hours each. But the Dara Luz works, such as Boogeyman, Law of Remains, and Tight Right White, are much tighter. They cram three hours worth of material into an intense 90 minutes. Part of this was due to logistics. After dealing with significant walkouts during intermissions for Amadea, Reza decided he would never do an intermission again. But when he came to the LATC, Bill Bushnell told him he needed intermissions if he wanted to do three hour shows. Reza didn't like this, so 90 minutes it was. But the argument could also be made that Reza knew he was racing against time. He would die from AIDS-related complications in 1995 at the age of 32. In the span of a decade, he created more work than many directors create in a lifetime. The extreme condensation of time, the extreme speed of the Dara Luz productions was part of this. He was creating as much and as fast as possible. Father was a peculiar man, was either created right before or during the period that Reza found out he had HIV. It is the last of the sprawling early works. It is the last of the plays written in full with Miralani. To go back to my earlier point about how it is the transitional piece in his canon, it is also the bridge between his early unnamed company, which was centered around the actress Meg Krzyzewska, and the company with which we now associate him, Dara Luz. The actors in the earlier company were a bit older, were often formally trained. Dara Luz were younger, punkier, and a bit rawer, more willing to go to the extremes that Reza wanted to push them to. For those of us who consider ourselves to be Reza nerds, there's something a bit startling about watching Tony's film of Father because we see an actress like Meg and an actress like Juliana Francis Kelly together sharing the same screen. So much of Reza's early work feels like it is lost to history. It is the Eurydice that has slipped from our grasp. We didn't yet have Adam there to document it all. And so to borrow somewhat liberally from ancient myth, which we know Reza was obsessed by. To me, Tony's film feels like the ferryman Karen, leading us down the river Styx into the Hades of Reza's untapped, understudied early works. It is the beginning of an important journey backwards. And so without further ado, I'll turn it back to him. So when uh, we did Father in the summer of 1990, that hot, intense summer of 1990, um, the videographer, Mimi Storm, who is here with us tonight, uh, showed up um, at, you know, many times during the month that we performed and shot tons of video. There was 13 hours of this incredible footage. Um, but the piece itself is a maximalist, sprawling piece. and so. The 13 hours are also maximalist and sprawling. Uh, one of the things that's really uh, exceptional to me about the footage, it really kind of captures the feeling of a person wandering through this amazing wild landscape. And I think that um, that amazing wild you are there quality uh, prevented it from being cut for many years because people who didn't really know the show intimately would look at it and they were like, I can't figure out how this all fits together. But I'm very fortunate that I had a really fun role, but a very, I didn't have much lines. I spent most of my time in the play sitting watching what was going on. So, um, and I've actually been looking to work with the material for, I don't know if you know this, Me Storm, but I, back in the 90s, I actually got my hands on some dubs of it, and I tried to cut together an early version just with two VHS decks, trying to figure it out. So uh, when uh, Patty Abar at Brown University got a grant to do a project documenting uh, this work in particular, because it's really the work that has, that's, that's never really come together, it, the footage has never really been documented before, I finally had my opportunity to uh, fulfill my obsession with going into this material. 
we have a lot of original cast members here tonight. This is really exciting. Uh, so we're going to have a talk back afterwards. And uh, I, the other thing I did, which I just want to let you know, is that I decided to do the whole movie as a split screen. Because with this piece, it's so sprawling. How could you ever choose where to put the viewer's attention? So I decided to just lean into an experiential way of being in the piece. And anybody who saw an original Reza show would know if you went in and you tried to sort of follow it in a typical way, a typical linear way, your brain would short circuit. There's no way to really uh, um, be a successful audience member in a Reza piece without just letting yourself go into the experience, let it wash over you. And then maybe two weeks later, you'll wake up in the middle of the night and go, oh my God. That's what that moment meant. So um, just give deep breath. <laughs> Try not to, you know, hold on too much to anything, uh, you know, like what's going on. Just let it happen. And uh, that's it. I'm going to get it going. Just give me a moment to figure out the video and we'll get started. The, um, so I heard you, we, we, the piece was three hours long, but the video is only two hours long. So that's one of the advantages of doing a split screen. We can fit four hours worth of footage into a two hour film. See what I'm doing though here, right? Please stand by. Don't Please stand by the story of Ivan the Terrible. Order. Order too. Ivan Terrible, brand new Moscow, first formally seen the title of Ivan. After the war with Poland and the death of his first wife, these respected him spiritually every way. Bits of rage alternated with periods of repentance and prayer. While in one of his fits, he killed his own son and his wife. Paul is concerned the exact number of his wives. He was troubling everybody then in Germany. Ridding himself of unwanted wife by forcing them to go under bail or arrange for their murder. Despite his grocery deal, it remained in the jail chief in the room. Maybe he was in the distant construction during his reign. His two sons, Theodore and Dimitri, survived his art, but his favorite, Boris, he was not gain the power. Now, everybody said that Boris arranged for the murder of Theodore's younger brother and heir Dimitri to get the power. Or 
Century pop music, a thesis by Ivan Karamazov. I think the point is simply this that all these cross the stuff, she, we thought for a while, I think, in the early 80s when she started this, but it was kind of like his crime. She was spitting on our Christian heritage that these symbols were, that she was making fun of the symbols. Clearly, now she is not. We know in 1990 she's going for the big time. She is Christ. She is taking over and becoming our religious center. I think she's earned it. I think she has very interesting philosophy. It's tied clearly with uh, the California New Age stuff. Uh, be yourself, both you know, get out there, do whatever you want. But the masses that he is affecting, it is over. Well, far more than Christ ever did. Far more than the Jewish tradition. Australia, Austin, Europe, Japan, everywhere is about gone. The latest studio, well, not the latest, the one that I like the most right now, like a prayer. Here again, the imagery is over. What she's doing in this one, she's down on her knees, giving this guy a blowjob, not in the video, but in the song. It's clearly, you call my name, it's like a prayer. I reveal you in the yard. It's a blowjob, and it's a prayer. So Madonna now, in the age, age of age, is incorporating sexual imagery. Now, this is not unlike Christ. Christ, too, is seen naked in our culture, seen in rags in the 20th century. Though, oh, no, no, he's not sexy. Jesus is not sexy. He is sexy. Clearly, the sexuality and spirituality relationship has been evident for always. Madonna is playing on it now. The difference is that Madonna is not going to die. We will not have to kill her. We had to kill Marilyn just because, you know, these people we adore must die. We had to kill Christ. We don't have to pay Donna. She's out to prove it. She will grow old with us. We will all grow old together. We will not die. In this way, she is our redeemer, I believe. I never got back to Back, which has a front, 
I never would have done so if I'd known that he'd be frozen stiff. My wife said, George, I'm so unhappy. Our baby's now completely dropped. Zacchaeus was a wee little man, a wee little man was he. He climbed up in the sycamore tree for the Lord he wanted to see. And when the Lord came passing by, he looked up in the tree and he said, Zacchaeus, you found that. I'm going to your house today. I'm going to your house today. No one believed that his father would ever die. No one would ever believe it if it hadn't been for him. I have urges and urges to eat. Me nails are bitten down stubs, me love. Me nails are bitten down stubs. Criminal interrogation followed the poker game. After a tremendous tension, I'm okay. <laughs> Thinking with the to sings a song. Thinking with the bed to wanders in. She sits there eating a roll. She sits there scratching and picking and scabbing on her face on her feet. Thinking with the bed to sings a song. She sits there blubbering and scratching and picking and scabs on her face on her feet. Theodore jumps her and tickles her and humps her. She giggles, she groans, he rolls off of her. Thinking with the bed to sings a song. Then she vomits. She plays with the vomit. father was a peculiar man. He was always getting into trouble. If you couldn't find him at home, you could always find him at the police station or some saloon. They said he got lunch in one day. Straight to the police station. There, I found him. There were two other cases up before fathers. The first man was charged with pair, stealing a pair of pants. And the judge dismissed him. He said you couldn't make a suit out of a pair of pants. <laughs> the next man was charged with petty larceny. He stole three bottles of beer. The judge dismissed him, too, said you couldn't make a case out of three bottles of beer. <laughs> And father came up. The judge said, what are the charges? And father said, if you let me out of this, I'm going to charge you with it. The judge then said, haven't you been here before? And the father said, yeah, I've been here. Well, have you been here for Ask the judge. Well, yeah, but I'm here. Well, yeah, but I'm here. Well, yeah, but I'm here. It's kind of football weather all year long. It's not even no exception. No, it really is. And even when he came into the judge, this man came home with another baby. Come on. Any man has the right to go or why? Thought it was easy to get out and stuff like that. Well, that was just. That was a nice. Oh, I had a nightmare in bed, but the bed was a little buggy, so I took the mare of the buggy and I drove out of town. <laughs> I love the my
You must sit on all sides of the table. You must encircle the table. We sit around the table. You must encircle the table. Please must encircle the entire table. You must encircle the table. You must sit down. This is the last part. You need to be together. Are you blushing, Alidosha? 
my little not my precious darling, my little my little you can wonder after your shit got rest your soul. She was crazy as a shit house plan. It was all of that train. Now you must be Dr. Seuss and uh, 
Fighting prejudice. My favorite activities are walks on the beach and ripping wings off of insects. <laughs> I'd like to thank my fellow contestants for voting me this congeniality. It's because I'm still in my drive. I'd like to thank the judges of this pageant for allowing me to fulfill what I'm sure is every American girl dream come true, and that is seeing their slightly flaccid, semi pulsating penises pushing up against my soft thighs. You know, this is really good, dog. I see the chocolate and something at the man is that your friend. Very tasty. Come see your old dad tomorrow. Okay. I mean, see the chocolate? Uh, okay. Uh, For my life, you really should be a You're not even a girl. You just want to get a straight job. Why did you come up to your
Herself in a garret, a silly bitch. And her son, Dimitri, is just practical. When she was there, it was exactly the same as this scene you just saw. Uh, Come on, 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 I'm 
I read before the Lord and he inclined unto me. I heard my cry and he pulled me up out of the horrible pit. Out of the fiery clay and he has set my feet upon a rock and established my goings. And he has put a new song in my mouth. Even praise unto our God. Many shall see it in fear and trust in the Lord. Buffalo girls want to come out and I'm going to come out and I'm going to come out and Buffalo girls want to come out and I'm going to come out and dance by the love of the music. Buffalo girls want to come out and ask me for a house. My house is coming. Lower disorder, Leosha asks. Yes, please, little demon answer. I want disorder. I keep wanting to set fire to the house. I keep wanting to uh, creep up and set fire to the house with a fly. It must be on the side. Sometimes it's out of the dawn burning. And I'm going to say nothing. I'm going to say Oh, she took it on your mother. She won't put it down. 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 She won't
because I'm a Russian peasant boy doesn't mean that I can't do what I want and my want. Close enough, I was in a duel before I became a monk. I was an officer. I was in a duel. I stopped the duel and became a monk. People thought it was funny and entertaining. A man came to me to confess a murder. I told the man to confess the murder to the police, although it had taken place years and years ago. Thanks to God, no one would believe him. The man hesitated for a while, thought about killing me because I was the only one who knew about the murder. Uh, <laughs> then he finally confessed. I don't remember if they believed him or not. He killed his mistress as well. I don't remember if anyone believed him or not. I don't remember anything anymore. He's not like to be able to keep just fathers and teachers. I found her. What is hell? I maintain it is suffering. Like not being able to love. I can't remember anything anymore. <laughs> Shut up, shut up. A few good memories before the end. And don't be any fun, but it takes its own sweet mind. I was getting out of the house. I was going without one minute of energy. I was looking myself in a new world. You managed to get yourself neatly, Barker. Don't be any fun. But it takes its own sweet time. In those last days, I drove through the streets of my gate city like a blind man. Do I wish to be saved? Am I having second thoughts? Because you never want to allow to be a little girl. <laughs>
Oh, there's a tear in her eye. I actually don't cry tears for me. I will always remember you. Tomorrow I leave for Moscow. It will be a long time before we see each other again. I'm glad I didn't say it. You know what I mean when I say TV, don't you? No! You can tell anything if you want, but we just didn't know what you want to say. I don't know what you want to say. Here's what we found from the letters we found in his pocket. And then they killed a bunch of kids, killed everybody. And then they killed a bunch of kids, and killed him. Now that is the only difference. Grim, uncompromising lines. I think I was knocked down by a hidden run driver along about 10 o'clock at night. So long as I was shot. It was a hundred days, it wasn't it? It was a hundred days, it was. Were my eyes set in? Jack, I wouldn't get in that car. And I was never allowed to be a little girl. <laughs> you can't park the car and have a gal anymore, but you can still go down the harbor and watch the sharks in the water. <laughs> I was in the 90s about the whole world being manic depressing. The whole world being manic depressing and you know, happy and sad and happy. You could live the way it would have been, perhaps, but I must leave you now and wait for the point of the destiny. You'll meet me most definitely. I have to go now. Thank you for your letter. There were several misspellings. I corrected them for you. And the setting at the end of the poem, as you call it, although it was interestingly graphic, it is still, at least in this reviewer's opinion, somewhat vague. Perhaps you'll enlighten me in your next letter. Not my words. So, my next letter is love. I don't think so. I don't think Ivan loves anyone. Yeah. You got like twelve between a and a walking buffalo. I don't know. John Ann's mother, Buffalo, I love you. Are you going? 
Yes, I remember when I was to bid her farewell to send his compliments. <laughs> his compliments. Ariosha, do you think I'm capable of murdering the old man? Don't think about it. I wish I could, Ariosha. I wish I could find more clients. Ariosha, do you think I'm capable of doing this? No. Do you think Demetrius? No. But remember, words are as powerful as action. Uh, we must talk, Ariosha. We haven't talked to you enough. Okay. We'll talk tomorrow. We'll talk tomorrow, Ariosha. We'll talk tomorrow. Yes, Yvonne, if you want to, we will talk tomorrow. So new to me, what you do to me, I feel daunting. What you do to me, I might be your son. All right, I die again, my throat slip. Thank you all for coming to my farewell speech from Atlantic City. <laughs> I take back to Arizona fond memories of my fellow pageant contestants. <laughs> that is such bullshit. I take back to Arizona a bunch of fucking roses in the title of this fucking congeniality. <laughs> All I wanted was to be worshipped and adored by millions of people. Is that too much to ask? If I could pray to God, will it be good for my career? <laughs> yes, but it, it might not be what you think it'll be. I got caught up in chasing the dollar and thought I'd lost the volition to follow what's in my own heart. Yeah. To follow what's in your own heart. None of my ex-husbands will talk to me, not one of them. I've been lonely for so long. Rich and lonely for so long. 
I, I eat the same things every day. It's important to me. I'm a lot like Father Farrakhan. What do you mean? Mushroom. <laughs> Mushrooms are a tomato, avocado, and bean sprout sandwich on whole wheat, dry, no mail, well done in the French fries, blue cheese on a salad, and a pickle. <laughs> you eat the same thing every day. I do, except when I don't. <laughs> I'm going to catch your phone. Yes, you can. Did I tell you that I really love you? Lisa says, my personal motto is honesty. Lisa Betta says, because. Lisa Betta says, what you put out into the universe, Lisa Betta says, comes back to you. Lizabetta says, and I want honesty too. Lizabetta says, come back to me. One of them kills the father, it makes about three or four brothers, father, son, holy ghost, and Satan. What role do women play in this? The world is full of lies, and Lizabetta believes in honesty. This is where I am, and this is where I will be. This is where I am, and this is where I will be for a while. Let the light shine in the sight of them. Let them see the good things that you do and pray to God. Don't pile up your treasures on earth, your lumps and dust, and swallow them and make break it and seal. But keep your treasures in heaven, for nothing can smoke and then nobody can break in. Over your treasure, they say, over your property also. And when you fast, let it be a secret between you and your father, and your father knows that secret between you and your children. Going by the narrow gates. The wide gate and the broad road leads to disaster, and there are many people going in the The narrow gate and the hard road lead out to life, but only a few are finding it. <laughs> Wow, old Theodore is going to get more and more and more uncomfortable until eventually he has to leave. He's going to leave belligerently. That's what buffoons always do. They work themselves up and they work themselves up and they work themselves up and they have to leave. And when they have to leave, they have two choices. They can leave apologetically or they can leave belligerently. Old Theodore decides to leave belligerently. They're going to say to him, I'm sorry, the interview is over. You will have to leave now. The opportunity for our salvation has passed and you blew it. You're going to have to leave. We'll forgive you, but you will have to leave now. And he's going to say to them, fuck you. Fuck you. Oh. Eventually, 
I'm still the hero around here. It doesn't matter if I am contemptible. It does not matter. I am still the hero. <laughs> Joins a consciousness raising group, relationships constantly changing. Intelligent women continue to choose partners who are wrong for them. <laughs> Back in 83, there was a guy named Zulu. I met him at Petunia's. We got married two weeks later. Then Nicodemus jumped in and saved me. It all had something to do with voodoo. Is this embarrassing or what? Rabbi, we know you are a teacher come from God. <laughs> I just put this girl up like a dog being exciting and abusing the crowd of a misadventure that the little black boy who never let go of his little sister's hand, not even until rubber skeletons in the closet. Well, not in LA. In LA, they take their skeletons out of the closet and separate them at a party or at a seminar. Is this New Orleans or is this Siberia? My heart are beating. which is not the burial custom of the Jews, which is now the burial custom of the Jews. The Jews want nothing short of perfection. So we shouldn't want perfection. No, we should want perfection. We should. Yeah. Yeah. Let's face it, we'll probably all die in race wars. That's what my daughter said when she was there back in 83. They put him in prison. It doesn't matter. We all shaved our heads and had his babies. <laughs> Nerdy, 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 nerdy. Here I am, the real criminal right here. Right. In the courtroom, uh, well, Your Honor, Smerdjikov killed him. He did it because I told him to. Who has not wished for the death of his father? A witness? Well, yes, I have a witness. You're not going to like this. So you see, he's got a tail. Well, it's this devil. This devil comes and visits me every night. But he saw it, and he's a witness. No, I'm telling the truth. No! No, I am saying no! The gates of heaven open up. The young girl in an attempt to save Ivan from disgrace produces a letter written by Dmitri announcing his plans to murder his father in order to pay back the money he owes. This factor, above all others, condemns Dmitri. <laughs> The makes of So I know that I be but I am not guilty of that. I 
Those are strong words. Stronger than your father's shot? Your father threw his axe against the wall. And they stuck. I'm going to Arkansas tomorrow. I'm going to Arkansas. I'm going to Arkansas tomorrow. I'm going to work. You know, things are so complicated these days. We can't get something for nothing. Every time I go out with a guy, it's like I got a calculator going in the back of my head. He brings me like five drinks. Okay, missionary position, no big deal. <laughs> drinks and dinner, I'll get on top. I'll do the work. Drinks, dinner, theater.
in a play. Funny note. <laughs> he sent me his photograph and a funny note. And I met him right in there. That'll be a penny. <laughs> God bless you. <laughs> We ate French fries and drank white wine. It was summertime. It was summertime. That'll be a penny. Oh, God, we left somewhere. We rented a loft in the East Village. 1,500 square feet of Southern Exposure. I made him coffee and baked potato and sour cream and chai. That'll be a nickel. Uh, I'm getting higher and higher. Bastard. <laughs> God bless you. It was a wonderful summertime. We were young enough to still believe in miracles, but old enough to know. That miracles are fragile. Old enough to know that miracles need nurturing in order to survive. That'll be the quarter. That'll be a quarter. There's some rules. Oh, I know. It's a Thanks. We met love in every possible position. He had the most beautiful penis I had ever seen. That'll be a dollar. Come up with the dollars. Don't be so fast. Please have your orange tickets ready. There will be no photography or recording of any kind upstairs. Thank you. I asked BW to come over to the corner over there. Very good. She wandered through the three rooms upstairs. He found his nightmare. I tried to give him some and you know, he would take him back to that permission. So, uh, you tell him to come over here and I'll give him a off of this Thank you. They are. I was very close to my sister. I, I was very tight with my sister. We were very close until she started practicing black magic when I was about eight. She always started sticking great big huge needles in my teddy bear's eyes and asking me if I was getting a headache. 
It never worked, so she started sneaking into my room at night when I was asleep and cutting off great big pieces of with my hair. For years, I looked like an escape from a lunatic asylum. I would wake up in the middle of the night and she'd be standing at the edge of my bed with my teddy bear in one hand, which tucked my hair glued all over it, and scissors in the other. And she'd say, I'm going to kill you someday. And she'd explain the syndrome of the teddy bear again. She's a psychologist now. My mother used to wake me up in the middle of the night too. She was a Jim from Taylor at the bottom of my feet. She said she wasn't trying to see this crap like my sister. She didn't like to see me jump in anyway. She had one page of the ring. He went out and screamed me. The reason I really liked it all my parents was that they never hit us. And if she ever did anything wrong, they never hit us. They took their pants instead. You know, they marked it to the kids that would write something old friends or pop the hands to the blender. And we just found the door to the phone home. For a while, but then after a while, you know, we freaked out a pet. So then they started aiming a bullet. They <laughs> going at us. I told you, trigger. Ah, oh, you're scared for a while. Fine. Oh. You know, I was just going to say because I thought I'd make brother you. The first time I got flooded off with linoleum. I never believed. Police like police are a story, you know? Because after all, the honey I'm going to taste is just a thing. Yeah. It was a prime party when I was six or seven. It was a 
surprise party for a boy in my class at school. He was a half bad day of school with all of his friends whispering and giggling exclusively on the schoolyard whenever he came near them. He was crying on the schoolyard. I told him it was a party for us. I thought I did it to make him feel better. I thought I did it because I made him feel alone. The rules you may inspire are simply of course. Bad people, bad people, and insane people. Too much time off from work. Yes, nothing. 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 I will thank you because love in action is a harsh, dreadful thing to hear this love and meaning. If you act like an assistant, you'll be treated like an assistant. I hate answering machines. You can do anything, it's just deciding you want to do.
Questioning our faith, playing around with the name of our spare time, refusing to speak with God when we tell folks. One day we will be sorry, I suppose. God stops telephoning and breathing heavily into our answering machine. Huh? Then we too will be left with sagging chins and breasts, lottery tickets stuck to our inner body. <laughs> Let your light shine in the sight of men. Let them see the good things that you do and praise your Father. Now, 
They had not far to carry the coffin to the church, not more than 300 paces. It was still a clear day with a slight frost. The church bells were still ringing. Snigiroff ran fussing and distracted after the coffin in his old short summer overcoat with his head bare and his old soft wide brim hat in his hand. At one minute, he stretched out his hand to help support the head of the coffin and only hinder the bears. At another, he ran alongside and tried to find a place for himself there. A flower fell on the snow, and he rushed to pick it up as though everything in the world depended on the loss of that flower. And he whispered, who asked us? And he went at last. She sat over her face, looked at her voice, went to class. He came to born and not to be, but we ate the his voice. He kissed her, looked at his voice, went He entered into the chamber and went there. He went to the class. He heard the people weep around him. 
Hi, lady. How are you? I'm very happy. I'm excited and thrilled. My stomach is in nuts, and I don't know what to do. A talk? So, so sold out. Yeah. Yeah, okay, I'll let you get the guy. <laughs> Oh. 
excellent source of protein and calcium. That's right. An excellent source of protein and calcium. But don't get that on I broke your heart. Yeah, if you hit it with the very end, it hurts. Yeah, it's curling around. Thank you very much. Okay, so do you have to balance on? Oh, that's beautiful. Where'd you get it from? Mmm. My tits are killing me. Hi, Mom. Hi, Dad. Wait till you see me in this play. You're really going to love it. Bring all your friends from church. Bye. I surrender to Reza's Will you help me uh, build a heart, please? I get the star phone for it. I love you.
okay, so um, let me introduce some of the people that are here. Okay, fantastic. So um, a couple of things. Uh, we have pictures from the uh, Cuban Exchange that you can see here on the back wall. Um, but first I want to say that um, Philip Sperber, who is now 102, was an angel of AIDS and saved my life. He's uh, not going to see that one. That's amazing. So we'll give her a note of our gratitude while we're here. And uh, okay, so from this side, we've got Louisa Durr, who is a Maryland nurse. Adam Oslander, who is our Buster Keaton. Brian Bell, who is our Yalusha. Veronica Coven, who was uh, the dancing, uh, da the dancing vodka server, as we're called. Bruno Tell, who was in the original cast, but she'll tell the story about why she wasn't in it. She was in the actual performance. <laughs> Tom Fitzpatrick's father himself. <laughs> Julia Brothers, Miss Arizona. I played the character called the accountant, and I also had that big weird mask on. It was called the Lasher. Uh, Tom Pearl, and who's Jesus. And coming on stage is Sophie Derber, Mrs. H. And I'd also like to ask our cameraman, uh, Soren Lipton, to come on stage with Todd. Um, Lucia Mia, who played the amazing singing mother figure, is New Storm's mother, and it's her birthday. Come join us and talk about it. Sophie is here. Amazing. Everybody, let's hear it for Sophie Gerber. Put her in right here. So let's just um, go with, you know, so here we are. This show is 33 years in the making. We're here now. And uh, a lot of the folks here saw the film that took place at the College of Virginia in South Virginia in 1983 with our Cuban exchange performance. Um, let's just go down the line. Um, Adam, you're on behalf of this show first. Let's hear from you. Hi, John. Awesome. Talk about, like, um, how did you um, get involved in the project and being here? Uh, I auditioned, and the casting director, if I remember correctly, was Laura Barnett, and I had no inclination of performing when I had worked with Laura at Ensemble Studio Theater. And I had just finished a year on the road with Ringling Brothers Circus and had come back from Japan here and had just gone to work with them. Brothers and backstage, and I was like, oh, this makes sense. And I think it was an interview pretty much with Reza, uh, uh, Annie, and Laura. And I forgot exactly what was said, but Buster Keaton, I believe, came up because Reza loved Buster Keaton. Now, when, and, and he, whatever we said, he was like, oh, I'd like you to be in the film. And I think. I didn't know what I was getting into. And when we were rehearsing, I had no idea what I was doing. I was not Buster Keaton at that point. And I 
went to Reza and I basically said, what am I doing here? And the next day he said, oh, you're Buster Keaton. And it all, it all made sense. So um, what was it like to do the show for the first time? So I'm watching it now and I'm like, oh, I was a Greek chorus of one, you know, just trying to make sense of it. And when we were doing it, it really did all make sense, you know. Um, not all of the scenes were mine, but and you know, um, but the like that last song. It's like it's oh, this is all about life and the meaning of life and having to make sense of somebody finding their place and <laughs> having some sort of uh, uh, experience that makes it all make sense. I know that sounds crazy, but that's how I felt. I think you all felt that way as a guest. It goes through the whole experience and everything that goes on in there. And I think um, you know, you're 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 doing a tremendous job in terms of getting the audience to feel that way. Peter, you were Marilyn Monroe. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, uh, how did you feel about being Marilyn Monroe in this film? Did you feel that you were being cast? Uh, it awoke in my sexuality. Reza uh, suggested that I be Marilyn. It uh, really connected me to my sexual sexuality as just part of the human character of Marilyn Monroe. And of course, you seem to be perfectly comfortable with being yourself as an actress. What was the toughest thing to do able to go and have these fans telling me all these people who made me go blind give massages to each other and to go clean out dried blood and just blood and dust and goo all over the seat and you're just rolling in it and dancing and singing and it was such a command so much force and energy and you followed him and he believed in everything you said and wanted to do it was It is amazing that we were able to do those things and fly in uh, in a country that uh, would not be allowed uh, or accepted to do that. So it was just amazing. So Veronica, maybe you can pick another one up while I bring this to a, a stand. Where you were the saintly child, Volusia, Luke, but uh, your activities in the play weren't always that saintly. You were kind of uh, you, you had to do some good stuff there as well. No, it's it's true. Um, but like that was my case. I'm watching it after all this time. I remember going up to my friends and saying, "Hey, what are you doing? Because you made me think that you were the saint." Every time I would see him do that, I would think of it as just you know, like yeah, sure, I'm I'm like a saint, you know, but not not Keaton. And I I'm racing with Keaton constantly, even though I didn't know him that well. Really, I mean, this was from the outside. That's another story. But from the inside, you know, like even being a you know in the uh, in the army, I was kind of like you know I I believe in you, brother Mike. Kind of a fun show for kids to see. Yeah. So from the inside, you know, I could see how it could be from the outside, but from the inside, there were many things I did there that were just really fun and exciting. Um, what are your memories of being on the show? It's interesting, you know, of all the people that went with us, it's, you know, when you're a performer, you kind of get this little drum that you're in, you know, that you go 
then go back to the Lord. So this was no sense that this thing is never going to, at least in my view, it never wanted me to have a sense of joy. No matter what I was doing, there was never that moment where I said, oh, I know how to be happy in my old age. No. So um, I was always uncomfortable and I kind of always had to be just going to face it out in front of me. And that's what gets a little scary and people to say, hey, this is how far you can go? Well, I can go this far. <laughs> you know, and that as a lay person is very difficult to get that kind of sense of joy. But that's what Job says to us. He says, look, you're with me. And this is clearly going to say that I'm with you. <laughs> yeah, I felt that way too when I read what happened. Completely unconnected with my with my troubles, and after some work with Deb, that was fourth um, and fifth depression. Something you said in the back of the room that I think is worth mentioning is that some of the cases you see in terms of depression is that they have been What is, what is it you're screaming at Tom when you're throwing the bottle at him? Like, I know we deal with this kind of stuff on Mother Sucker and Mother Warm, but what, what is it that gets you going? Well, <laughs> and, uh, yeah. how'd you end up in the pee? Just to get a little bit of feedback. was a magical person. Teresa knew how to bring out the best in people's talents. So it resulted in those little masses that actually produced in time. Fifty little masses. And Teresa knew how to do this job. It was a secret love. She was lost in the old life. We were six people with dear friends. For me, that time of rehearsals and performing the show was like living in a dream. It was some kind of wonder where crazy, beautiful happy dream. And when it ended, it was gone. I think I first met Sabrina on the roof in South Korea. Yeah. And we were standing in this hot, hot car, and it was like so hot up there. And you were originally in your cab. Yeah. So what, so what happened? Yeah. So I was in the cab, and we were going to the Oscars. And for some reason, I had a trip booked for like a week before that.
looking at who I was and trying to figure out what I was doing wrong. And I was looking for the answer because that was the hope. That was the future. And so I landed in this place of trying to figure out what I was doing wrong. And I was going to this Christian faith center, which was, it was the exact location of a Catholic Sabbath day institution. Um, and I needed a Catholic vacation to do that. So what ended up happening was, and I have shared this with all of you, is that we were in the VA and I was working at the VA hospital because I was a nurse at the VA hospital wing. And there were carcasses and books and all kinds of things. And one of our rehearsal spaces was very dusty. And we were I think that dust was like old, old box clothes. So. You know, it was dusty, and we all took out our mops and sponges and towels and rags, and it was dry towels and rags. So that kind of the spectacle, the spectacular production, I ended up, we filmed it in April, getting a very spectacular film done by my friend Mark Dell. So I ended up having to drop out, but the connection had been made. Reza would come visit me where there was a park that was used for Angelica Dixon, an acrobatic group, and our book, The Lost Sea Queen. So that was the beginning of my vacation that then I could turn to watch rehearsals and to learn what the process was. But that connection was made in the film for the film. So Tom, I remember you doing yoga at those moments with all this dust and debris. Uh, yeah. Yeah, well, we st we actually have photographic evidence of you doing yoga at that. Yeah, well, you're still pretty skinny. <laughs> so, Tom, what's it like? You were extraordinary. I don't know, knowing you about some of the stuff you did in the speech, it's like, did I do that? So what's it feel like seeing the evidence of it? It's amazing. I don't remember any of it. I, I remember almost none of it. I remember that guy that came to the bus. I was so full of crap. That was, uh, you know, you're going to be Peter Gunnan this trip. And this time, you're going to have a guy come in with a fire and a heavy thing to do for us here in the city. <laughs> and then I had a friend that was the director of that film that I had seen for many years in Paris. And I went to his dorm room and I said, I have a friend here that you can have come in and do the film tonight. And he had one fucking act. And I did it. <laughs> Every night I would come in and do it. And he was like, he looked at me and he said, I have a magazine, you know, where they put the print stuff in and all that. And it's wide open. You know, it's like this cover that all the dust and debris is in. And it's closed. And it's like, this is the way you show crap. So I poked it in. It was very clear and I knew I had to do something with it. This was the speech that I did for the – so I, I kind of knew what to expect. But the idea that you could also look at it, you know, and I don't know how much of it really was covered. I mean, not really what you see on the film. You know, you could kind of have a more laser focus on what you were doing. You know, you knew you said this here, and then you had to push all the way down this bloody block to do your next scene. I remember the one – so Reza was doing it like a night kind of thing, and he said that the print stuff was everywhere. And uh, I was like, well, what time is it? And he said, you know, it's kind of dark. And I said, well, you walk to the table, the table. I had to go all the way, all the way to the square here. It's like some pile up. And then Reza runs in to me, and he grabs me by the lapels, and he says, what happens next? What happens next? You have to help me. You have to help me. I know what the fuck happens next. 
I'm on, and I'm way around there. Let go of me. <laughs> Maybe it's that kind of exercise you're going to do. It's, it's one of the beautiful things about being a Christian. Joy. I think of it as so cool. We need joy. And bless your heart, Joy. We need joy. And it's so great to have it. Anyway, I'm going to wrap here. I have to. They're going to be kicking us out of here soon. So, right. uh, Julia, I want to ask you something. A lot of your material, did you write a lot of the material that you did? I wrote all the books. Yeah. yeah. So, you see, this is a perfect example of how resident collaboration extended to the performance as well. So, yeah, yeah the Miss Arizona, did you, had you done that character before? Is it something you created right for this? No, that was for the show. Oh, yeah. yeah. After the show. Yeah. yeah, I mean, it was fun to play that particular character and play the kind of female casting director who had this fine group of friends who knew who she was. And so she was kind of the kind of like damsel in distress. And so um, Jake had said, well, uh, what can you do? And I said, well, I can do this. And I did uh, Queen Margaret from the musical Sex on the Heart in about 25 minutes. Yeah. Um, and um, it didn't go over well. We didn't have the money for that. But it, it was we had those things. We spent all afternoon just creating those things that we had to do. And it, it's not to say Queen didn't do well. And um, Tony and Sony and Jim Croft had those kinds of opportunities. And when we did, we just kind of let them do that. Arizona was the one. Did you did Miss Arizona go to those? Uh, no, no. Yeah. Um, but it's just that I think that you know it's also the the thing that drives so many people to want to tell their story and to keep their voice. But you know the the um, the innovation of the Miss Arizona was so incredible, and she kind of became this big thing in that idea of way over the place. She came up with these people, like like a hundred and fifty French people, and. And people, they were walking to the scene and she would come up with this big group of people. It's too late to do that. But you know, what's this about? Let's just do something that people will like. <laughs> no one will know that they're not in this show. <laughs> and so we did that with our show. We did that with our show. And I cried about three weeks and I was watching it and I thought, you know, this is not going to be good. And I had to go back and say, I don't know who you are. Sophie, you're here. Hi, Sophie. Yeah, could you tell us a little bit about what you thought of seeing all this after all these years? Just like, what did you think of this experience? Let's speak into the mic so we can hear you.
Talking about those in St. Paul, I think. Brendan, uh, uh, for Brendan uh, Doyle, who's the partner, uh, sent me a link to some um, announcements that we've been making on Facebook for months and never announced. So the next time we have a screening, they're going to have a special handout for everybody. Thanks, Brendan. Just a fact, just so I want to, if we could have Tom talk a little bit more. Some of them Actually, were not there, ladies. Actually, weren't? They weren't men?
the process was for me. I mean, people describe it as being like a painting of the Holy Spirit. I mean, I don't know what else to say. I mean, it's like a psychedelic moment, right? Um, and, and you know, it's just that kind of thing. 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 I love that the material is a picture of the Holy Spirit because on a called the Biller, an amazing actor based on a true you know so uh, it, was, it took a lot of stress to have uh, Patton cover your entire body with his face and it's just amazing and it's like that thing so you know um, when I was first looking at the footage uh, um, I was like wow there's a lot of footage of um, um, the two of you guys there's a lot of footage <laughs> but uh, it's this fun filming I love it and this is your birthday